Okay, well, good morning from Bethel Baptist Chapel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in God's house. Um, I'm looking forward to a couple of weeks and what the Welsh government will do, but it's starting to sound good. Um, but uh, anyways, I just wanted to welcome everyone and I'm glad you were able to come out this morning. And some guests and some visitors, I'm glad to have them back in the house of God, Mike. And as uh, well as you there, thank you so much for coming back. And um, let's open up a word of prayer this morning and we'll get started with our service. So most gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you. And we praise you in the name of your dear Son and our Savior, uh, through whom we have the hope of eternal life. And it's the hope that is, it's gonna happen someday. The question is when, not whether it will happen. And Lord, in that we take comfort, uh, that by faith and completed work, there's nothing we can add to that, although we should desire to serve you. So Lord, we just thank you that we're able to gather today and we have the breath of life we pray for those that are unable to make it in for the various reasons with isolation and some with illness lord we just pray for your healing hand upon them and those that have even come in uh, lord i think sometimes we're the walking wounded uh, so we do pray for your healing here as well uh, we do thank you that uh, we are able to gather and we pray for the chapels around this nation around the world that gather today that they would know your grace they would know your provision even in hard times uh, but through all this, Lord, we have that confidence uh, that you are reigning, you're on your throne, and one day we'll stand in your presence. Until then, help us to uh, serve you through your spirit and through your word and in your power. We'll make sure that we pause and we thank you uh, through it all. Indeed, as we leave here today, may we say it has been good to have been the house of the Lord. Amen, amen. Uh, so we're still kind of easing into music uh, this morning. I think everyone can see. Uh, we're going to do In Christ Alone. Still not doing the books yet until uh, with the, all the, the restrictions are gone and that we can't hand out paper. We really don't have a way to clean it. Um, so In Christ Alone. Go ahead and put the first thing on there. There we go. It's amazing, nothing, just don't go flying off. Okay. Well, this morning, 
We're up to Psalm 110. I think, Len, you have copies of the outline and the very simple psalm this morning. Uh, but Psalm 110, if you are interested, there are outlines for the sermon in the psalm in the back. And here we go. Psalm 110, verse 1 and following says, The Lord, this is a messianic psalm, by the way. Christ is going to point to it. And he's going to challenge the Pharisees. How does David say that his Lord, he says it right here, the Lord said unto my Lord. How can that be? How can someone that came after David be greater than David? How is this? Because he's already God the Son. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries, and he shall drink of the brook of the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. And that last part speaks that as he's going and doing his thing, he's going to refresh himself as he goes. And he'll raise his, raise his head in confidence because he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Wonderful, wonderful psalm there. Psalm 110. Oops, there it is. Uh, let's see. Um, announcements this morning. Kind of the same as uh, last time, thank you for the Sunday School lesson that Paul has posted both on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Uh, you can get to that from our chapel webpage. And uh, aside from that, the Sunday School lesson is there. If you want the worksheets to go along with that, contact me and we'll get those to you. Uh, parents, it's a great uh, opportunity to teach your children the, the truths of God. I can't emphasize that enough in this day and age. Uh, Scores a cup, our coffee morning will continue Wednesdays for the time being online from 10 a.m. till noon via Zoom. If you want to join me, send me a message and um, I'll send a link to you. And then our Thursday Bible study is the same. We're continuing through the book of John online uh, from 7 to 8 on Thursdays. And again, a great study, great study there. And I think that's all. Anything else going on? Oh, one thing I do want to say. I sent you a, uh, if you're on the chapel, email list. He received a copy of this from the Christian Institute. They're apparently concluding the Welsh government, that is, the Senate. Um, they, earlier this year, I'll just read this, passed the Curriculum and Assessment of Wales Act. And they are revising, they're taking a consultation now on relationships and sexuality education, which means we're just going to teach our children less about God and more about the world. And that anything's okay. There's no, nothing wrong that you cannot possibly do in this world. And that's me being a little sarcastic, but it's not far from the truth. And so take a look at this. Go to the Christian Institute. If you want, I'll leave it up here after service. But they're looking for citizens to give comment. Tell them what you think. And uh, weigh in on it. Um, we need to protect our children from inappropriate materials. They need to learn about the proper uh, nature of marriage. Even if there is an opposing view, we need to teach them the importance of family life and bringing up children. And uh, moral considerations, I have a feeling that's going to be really repressed under the religious side of things. But anyways, um, Christian Institute will have information on, on that or I can get it there. Welsh government is completing their, um, their consultation by the 16th of July. So you've got a couple of weeks to weigh in on that. If you feel strongly about it, I can't tell you what to do or what to say, but I can let you know what's going on. That's why we support organizations like the Christian Institute. Okay, well, this morning, continuing in our study through the book of Jonah, I'm enjoying this. I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying it. And I know that's, <laughs> I need to be concerned with what you are interested in as well, but uh, it's been refreshing my heart. A pastor asked me a couple of weeks ago, what refreshes you? I'll be honest. I want having a congregation like you. But two of those times when we get alone in God's word and he teaches us stuff and we grow and we, and we, we see him in a new way. So uh, we'll be continuing in Jonah chapter 3. I'll put the words up here. It'll probably be an eye chart for most of you, but I'll just read it. It's a short chapter. And we'll just read all of chapter 3 today, and we'll look at that. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Oh, I like that. 
saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Wow. A lot going on there. And there's some things you may be saying, wow, evil, God. And if God was really he going to do something evil, well, we'll talk about that. So, so this week we'll be looking at Noah, and he's the revival prophet at this point in time. Uh, each chapter is changing. Uh, he was uh, the reluctant prophet, then he was the repentant prophet. Now he's the revival prophet. We'll find out something about him next week as we finish it up in chapter 4. But I found a story this week. Let me turn this on. I found a story this week. Hopefully you're on. Am I on? Anything coming on? Technology, boom. It's as good as it's going to get. Double check. Something's going out, nothing's going out. I don't know. Uh, go like this, Brian. You need the receiver on. That's the sermon illustration. You have your receivers on this morning? Amen. I need it too. But I found a story as I was thinking about this, this passage. And some years ago, it goes this way. A manufacturer up in Scotland told the Sunday school teacher of a class of poor boys that he would get each of them a new, a new suit of clothes. That's quite a big thing. This is the time. It's about 1800 is when this happened, as best I can nail it down. It's about 1800. says, you know what? Each of your children that comes... I'll give him a new suit of clothes. That's quite a thing. It's quite a thing. And after a few, uh, let's see, the worst and most unpromising boy in the class was a lad named Bob. Poor Bob. And after a few Sundays, Bob went missing. His teacher hunted, hunted him up, it says, but found his new clothes torn and dirty. The manufacturer gave him a second suit. But after attending once or twice, Bob again absented himself. And utterly discouraged, his teacher reported to the manufacturer that they, they must give up. That's enough suits for Bob. But that manufacturer wanted to try just one more time. Amen. I'm thankful for people like that. And he gave a third suit if Bob would promise to attend regularly. And Bob did promise and attended faithfully. And later found Jesus as his Savior. Oh, what a wonderful thing to come out of a Sunday school program. And the end of the count is that discouraged boy... The forlorn, ragged Bob became the Reverend Robert Morrison, a great missionary to China in the early 1800s. And some say he's even the, one of the first ones. He translated the Bible into one of the Chinese languages. I wasn't able to get which dialect it was. And by doing so, little old ragged Bob was able to open up the gates to, of heaven to the teeming millions in China. I think that's a wise person that encouraged that teacher to try just one more time. Just go, well, give him one more suit. Let's see what happens. You know, we don't know what encouragement someone needs. And we don't know how God may have prepared hearts for that last request. Oh, what a thing it is. And today, as we look at the third chapter of the book of Noah, there's so many ways we can look at it. But we're reminded that God is a God of second chances. God is a God of second chances. I can think in my life how... I believe God called me to the ministry when I was in my 20s. And I'll tell you, when that call came, it was strong. I felt like this is something I ought to do. But I'll be honest, at that point in my time, I was converted years before. I, 
uh, graduated as an engineer and working as my first engineering job, I had not gotten connected to a proper local church. And I had questions. How does one go into ministry? And I got no answers because I didn't have a pastor to go to. And I'm so thankful you are here today. But this is just a call. Let me, let me re fast forward a little bit. And God is a God of second chances. It's a few years later, and Dave Campbell and Mary, we get the call. And what do we do? Kind of unsure, you know, is this really coming from God? We went and we sat down with our pastor. And we got wise counsel from our pastor because he was there. But I'm so thankful. The real point of this is I'm so thankful that God gave me a second chance because that's the reason why I'm standing here. And it's a little maybe off the point of the text, but the important thing is, oh, it's a second chance. And here's a transition back to this then. The people of Nineveh were at a crossroads. What do you mean? Well, it's either going to be a dead-end street or they're going to turn to God and repent of their wickedness. They needed someone to tell them that the path they were on was about to lead to their destruction. And Jonah was the man that God had selected for this task. You know, Jonah's first reaction was to run in his pride and his hatred, honestly, of the Assyrians. He ran. And yet Jonah repented once God had got his attention. And that's chapter 2. Now chapter 3, God has come to Jonah a second time. Yes, God is the God of second chances. Think about this in the Bible. I even think Moses has this. Moses killed a man because he tried to do God's work and the flesh didn't work. God picks him up, points him in the right direction. Abraham, Samson, David, Peter, John Mark into the New Testament. All were given second chances. All had failed, so in some cases spectacularly. But God gave them second chances. A little quote here out of the book of Micah. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Oh, we open up God's mercy when we repent. So what is God looking for? He's looking for that heart which may have failed, but it turns back to him seeking forgiveness. A verse I quote a lot, but I want to keep quoting it because I think there's a lot of people that aren't in church today. Because something's happened. And maybe they failed God, and maybe they feel like God's failed them. But addressing the first, 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. They cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, of course, God's forgiveness should not be a license to sin or to reject God's leading. You know, there may not be a second chance. God doesn't always promise us second chances, especially for a special call to ministry. But indeed, he is a God of second chances. But let's again not take that as a license to sin and to reject God. Indeed, Paul anticipates this in the book of Romans. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's preaching, oh, grace will save us from the worst. And people would ra rationalize, oh, I'll just keep on sinning because I will show how good grace is. I think we got some people like that today. And Paul's answer to them is, oh, God forbid, Romans 6, 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Oh, thankfully God reached out to Jonah that second time. And Jonah, though still having, he's got issues. Don't, don't get me wrong. We'll pick that up in chapter 4. But he's obedient to God. And God's faithfully going to, he's going to deliver the message that God has faithfully to the people of Nineveh. So let's look at this this morning, the revival prophet. The first thing we see is God repeated the call. You know, this chapter, like several other chapters, begins with God and ends with God. This is a book about God. It's got Jonah's name on it, but it ought to cause us to look up at God. And here is the long-suffering nature of God. And it's worked out in the life of the prophet Jonah. It said, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. That's a great verse to memorize. And essentially, essentially, it's the same wording that he had heard before, and God explains that he will give Jonah what to say. Don't worry, Jonah, I'll tell you what to say. And when you think about it, just for a moment, Jonah already had his marching orders. God said, go to Nineveh. He never said, stop going to Nineveh. He said, go to Nineveh. But he comes to him again. And I think that's a wonderful thing. 
This is maybe a Dave Campbell looking at this. You know, it's God is reminding and reassuring Jonah. He hasn't given up on him. Oh, Jonah, I got something for you to do. Yes, we stumble. And yes, you stumble. But go get him. He restores him. He says, you've got a task before you. You know that great fish? I kind of like the thought of the great fish did all he could. He got Jonah to shore, left Jonah on shore. Now it's Jonah's job to get over to Nineveh. I think of Jesus in the New Testament. We just went through Easter. And one of the most wonderful messages that comes after Easter is Jesus coming and talking to Peter. What did Peter say? I'll never leave you. I'll never reject you. Three times. And when the third time Peter realized what had happened, he went out and wept bitterly. Jesus came up to him and in effect puts his arm around him and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Oh, feed my lambs. He changes it up. Oh, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter had a charge from God that wasn't going to be stopped by him stumbling along the way. He used to take care of that infant church, help it to grow, help it to learn. God, had, the son had invested in him. It was up to Peter to invest in others to carry the, the message forward. And Jesus restores Peter. You know, God only needs to bring the call once to, to Joan. It's going to be enough. And through this call, God is going to show the power of his word spoken at the right time to the right people by the right person. He's going to work, I think, what is the single most great revival that the world has ever seen. He's going to show this prophet that he is the God of all the earth. You know, Israel had a job to represent God to the world. They were to be priests amongst all nations, just not their little part of the world, but everywhere. And God's going to show that. Oh, what an object lesson. And obeying the will of God. So we see God's repeated call. The first part, the restoration, I didn't bring up there. But the second part is receive. God's call to restoration. You know, maybe you're here this morning or maybe you're watching online. And quite honestly, you feel like you've let God down. You may have. Perhaps you've not followed through on a promise of service. Maybe you've not shared the gospel or stood to be counted as a Christian. You maybe have slipped back into an addiction. I don't know. And to be honest, that's between you and God. What I care about is that, that that moment of failure or shame is keeping you from God as a preacher of the word of God. I'm here to say God is the God of second chances. Jesus says, I'll turn away no one that comes back to me in faith. Come back to God. It's never too late to turn back to him while we have the breath of life. We have the hope that we can come back to God. We can be restored. We can be forgiven. Yes, there's consequences for sin. I'm not saying when we sin that all of our consequences go away. They don't. But, oh, I'd rather go through that with God. Walking with God. God says, oh, come back. I'm just a flat-out invitation. Oh, come on down to Bethel and Hollowell. I can help you to get restored with God. You can do it right there in your home. And when we do, then we have that hope of God before us, opportunities for serving Him and enjoying His abundant life. Receive that. Let me turn it around. This is probably the bigger part of the sermon here, but give God's command for restoration. What do I mean? We rejoice when we hear, oh, yes, God's the God of second chances. I'm so glad he does that. Oh, look what he did for Jonah. Look what he did for Dave Campbell. Let me turn it a little bit. Are we willing to be the people of another chance? This is where it gets hard. Are we willing to be the people of a second chance? We serve the God of second chances. Are we willing to turn that around? I'm not seeing being foolish. We don't forget what's happened if someone's done something wrong. But are we going to be willing to give them a chance to redeem themselves, to show themselves trustworthy again? This is where marriages get put back together. This is where lives get sorted out. And if God, we rejoice when God is the God of second chances. We've got to be willing to be the people of the second chance. Lord's Prayer, we're having communion today, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. What does he say in Matthew 6, 12? And forgive us our debts, or some translations may have forgive us our trespasses. Same thing, sins. Doesn't stop there. As we forgive our debtors. Oh, if we're going to come to Almighty God and ask to be forgiven, we need to be people of a second chance. 
people of another chance. I kind of use that because often we blow our second chances pretty quickly. We need another chance. Indeed, forgive us our debts. Again, putting a little spin on it. If we expect God to forgive us, to give us a second chance, then we need to be willing to offer the same. Again, we don't forget what experience has taught us, but it does mean giving that person a chance to earn our trust again. Oh, the repeated call. Let's move on. We see Jonah relented to the call. The first part here, oh, the journey. We're, we're not really told where the great fish lands and, and puts Jonah on the shore. I got a map here. Oh, I test. Mediterranean Sea, actually, I think it was just called the Great Sea at that point in time. He left down here. But his home was here. This is the Sea of Galilee. And his home was just a little bit to the west of that. He caught a, um, a boat in Joppa, which I think is up here. And there's actually a current that kind of goes to the north. So it probably came up a little bit. Wherever it happened, I don't know. But somewhere probably in this stretch of shoreline. There's Jonah. He's now got to take a journey. This is Nineveh. You have no scale here. That's about 425 miles as the crow flies. From his home, it's about 550 miles over in Nineveh. We're talking a month. It's easy. It just says that Jonah picked up and went, and the next thing we hear is at Nineveh. It's a month. It's a month. It's quite a journey. Three weeks maybe at the best. I think that's a lot of time that Jonah had to think about what God was trying to teach him. And what's interesting, there's nothing said of the journey. Nothing good or bad. And I don't want to read too much into it. It's really not the focus of it. But I'll say this. Where God guides, God provides. I don't think Jonah had any needs on that trip. I can just say in my life, and this is a, a scriptural principle you find in the book of Isaiah 43, chapter 2, actually chapter 43, verses 2 and 4. We'll find it later in chapter 58. Where God guides, God provides. What happened to the nation of Israel in the wilderness? He gave them manna for 40 years. Oh, he can take care of us and our little trips when we're doing something for him. I don't think Jonah had any needs. I think God provided what that prophet needed. Dave Campbell opinion, the journey, the city. And I leave this up just to, a, maybe as just a quick reminder, this is the, the, the Assyrian Empire at various stages. Um, at its early zenith, it's this kind of orangey color shape, pretty big size. At the time of Jonah, it has shrunk to this, they're getting pressure coming out of the north. And now this is the size of the nation. Do you think this is going to have a little bit to do with how they receive a message from a prophet about destruction? Oh, yeah, I think so. Opinion. But again, I want to put this in a historical context. It's about 760 B.C. when Jonah had his ministry. We can't ignore what we know about the time. But this is the nation of Assyria at that point in time. Later on, about 100, and 100 years or so, It'll reach another zenith, even larger. In fact, they will be used to punish um, Israel uh, when, they, when, they, when they grow to such a site. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. At this time, in 760 B.C., 770 B.C., Nineveh wasn't the capital of Assyria, but it was still a great city. And we'll find that it was probably about uh, eight miles circumference for the walled city. The walls are 50 feet thick. I've seen, I don't think I've seen a 50-foot thick wall at any castle here. In, in the UK yet. I've seen some thick ones, but not that thick. 100 feet tall. And the greater city was about 60 miles around. That's where it says he had a three days journey. And God himself states in Jonah 4.11 about the city that there were some 1,200 people, souls, eternal souls, who were in jeopardy. And again, that can maybe be more people if God was referring to people of accountable age or maybe it's referring to children. I'm not going to get into that right now. But it says souls that didn't know the right hand from the left. Oh, they needed someone to come and talk to them. So the journey, the city, and then the message. <laughs> the significant part of this passage is that God gave Jonah what to say. And rather, rather this terse statement, I, mean, I spend like hours preparing a sermon, trying to find a good bridge and, and illustrations. What does God give Jonah? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 120,000 plus saved. Amen. That's the power in God's word spoken by the right person at the right time. It's actually only five words in the Hebrew if you care. You probably don't. Now it's likely that he included some ex explanation as to who God was that sent him from. But it's not really included. 
This isn't a popular, seeker-friendly message. The powerful part here is that Jonah entered that city for his call from God and began proclaiming God's message to them shortly after entering it. I think this is a reminder. Are we busy in this chapel and in our lives about what's important to God? Yes, we have jobs, we've got careers, we've got family, we've got things to take care of. But in our lives, are we keeping God at the center of it? Especially this ministry, this is a challenge to me. Are the things that we set up to do, are we reaching the lost world? Are we reaching them in a God-honoring way? It's a challenge. Some of the last words Jesus gave as marching orders to the disciples, and I believe they apply to us. In Matthew 28, 19, it says that Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. That's our job. What are we doing it? I think we are. Can we do better? Of course we can do better. But keep this our focus. I think it's a timely message, especially today as we'll be observing Lord's Supper at the conclusion of today's service. Part of that ordinance is to remember that we're busy reaching out with the hope and good news of Jesus Christ because he's coming back. He's coming back. And even with the simple words of, of John, it says, here we go, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. There's a message. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Oh, are we sharing that in love? Are we sharing that in all that God's given us? Okay, so we have God repeated the call. Jonah relented. Ah, an interesting part. And Nineveh responded to the warning. Oh, well, again, when God's man brought the message from God, we see a powerful response. It always doesn't happen. But it happened in this heathen nation. It says in verse 5 that the people of Nineveh believed God. That's important. This repentance reached from the king of the city to the least of the people, and even included animals. That may sound a little weird, by the way. You're putting a ashes and sackcloth on your donkeys and such. But actually do it. We kind of do a little semblance of that today. What happens if you've ever seen a uh, funeral where it's like a horse-drawn carriage? We put things over those animals. But even an ancient authority has it that they actually, in some cases, we have records of them putting the, the, the sackcloth on animals, just a little interesting thing. And again, what is sackcloth? You may I, we use this term. This is what the poor uh, people and what slaves customarily wore. So why do you wear it? It depicted that the entire population viewed themselves as needy, in need of God's mercy in this case, and slaves, slaves to God in this case. The king decreed it over the city. In fact, he declared that there would be a time of fasting and turning to God and appealing to God with repentance, it says, turning away from their evil ways. In fact, we get a glimpse of what they were guilty of that had caused them to come before God. And it says they were a violent people. If you study the Assyrians, they were a violent people. They thought nothing of staking someone to the ground and just letting them die. They take their skin off when they're alive. Skin them alive. Wow. Apparently God tolerated that for a time. He's ready to judge it, but in a very interesting Thing. Again, this is a very unique prophet because God, this is the only prophet we have that God sent to a heathen nation with a message of repentance. In the Old Testament, it's the only one we have with a message of repentance. Yes, there's other messages that go out, but never turn. Interesting thing. So the response, they turn. And what was the reason? I, I, I can only speculate, I'll be honest. The Bible doesn't say. It's, it's, again, a unique book here, but we, we, it's a heathen nation. They hear a message of repentance, they repent. And obviously with earnest hearts, we'll talk about how God viewed it. You know, we looked at the map and we, said, we saw the map that, well, they were probably looking at their extinction as they saw their massive empire shrink down. Maybe that was part of their attention. They didn't want to be totally wiped off the map. It could be God used that. Some will speculate that because they worshiped the fish god, they're one of these groups that worship Dagon. If they saw Jonah getting spit out in the land, they go, whoa, our God's brought us somebody. It never says that, though, does it? Didn't say if anybody saw him. That's speculation. 
It's possible that a Jewish prophet traveling all the way up to Nineveh to warn them, they were, they did listen to prophets. And if you came from an unfriendly nation that's saying, you're in trouble, you need to turn, you need to repent to God. That might have made a difference. He's got credentials just making the trip. I don't know. The emphasis is that God sent the message and the people feared God and repented. You know, Jesus points to this event and declares that the men of Nineveh will stand in judgment and condemn the generation in Israel at the time of Jesus that rejected him. And why is that? Well, he says, one greater than Jonah is before you. And when you start to think about it, it's amazing. Jonah was there a day, and they're repenting in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus spent three and a half years in his earthly ministry proclaiming God. Jonah came bringing no miracles. None that they would have known of. Jesus does miracles to prove that he's the Messiah, healing and feeding, raising from the dead. Jonah was just a man sent by God. The very God, the Son, was there. Yes, indeed, the people of Nineveh will stand in judgment because one was much greater that was preaching to them and showing them true life. And I think in this, we might just be challenged. If you're listening today, are you ready for that judgment? You place your faith and trust and hope in the living God, the one that was the Messiah, who did die in our place, that we could be reconciled. Oh, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through repentance and faith in God. So just two points here. They responded to the warning. Then a rather almost a curious statement that God repented of his warning. Let's look at the positive part, the easy part. Indeed, God shows great mercy, I think, by sending Jonah with a warning to this heathen nation before judging them. He could have just judged them. He didn't. And it's no surprise that when the people responded quickly and completely that he didn't bring his judgment upon them. They did what he asked. That's the core of Jonah's objection to this assignment. Oh, that God would show mercy to these people that ought to die will be forgiven. And I think there's a powerful, powerful lesson here. Do we have the viewpoint of God? You know, I think eternity is a long time. And God knows what eternity, apart from Him, is going to be like. He created a place called hell, really, for Satan and his minions. But those that reject God in this life are going to go there, too. And God would rather see someone come to repentance than go there. What do we see? Do I have the verse here? Well, this is the core of the gospel. Core, the, the, I'm getting a little out of order. Oh, here we go. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Those long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish. Perish means in hell, eternity. There is no oblivion that some cults will teach. There is no second chance. There is no praying out of purgatory. It's eternal. And it was so important for that 120,000 that God took this reluctant prophet, had a couple of false starts with him, and he sent them up there. Why? Souls are important to God. Let us have that eyesight. Why do I say that? We live in a time where, I tell you what, there's some people that get me wound up by what they're saying, but they're still eternal souls. Don't ever lose sight. Who you're talking to is an eternal soul. That will give you some patience. Oh, to have the eyesight of God in doing that. But what do we see in this nation? I'm going to go back to this, this point here. They did what God asked. This is Peter's testimony. Not Peter. This is Paul's testimony. Later on in the book of Acts, he says, testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks, two things. Repentance towards God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent, turn away from your sins, then place your faith in Christ. Why? Because he Died for your sins. That's the core of the gospel. Turn, repent, and believe. What did they do? It says they turned. They turned from the wickedness. And they believed God. They met the requirements. Some will say, well, this wasn't a, an earnest belief. I, I'm not going to argue with God. God stayed his judgment on them. I think this nation earnestly turned to God. Now what's sad, it'll be about 40 years later, what's going to happen to the northern ten tribes of Israel, called Israel. The Syrians are going to come down and wipe them out and disperse them. God will use Assyria 
to judge them. How did that happen in 40 years that they became to the point where they were at war with them? What happened to the great Welsh revival in the early 1900s? It evaporated, folks, in other revivals. So it doesn't take long for people to forget a commitment a generation has made. And certainly within two generations, we'll see Assyria go from believing in God and repenting from their wickedness to right back at it. You know, but what's going to happen to the Assyrians 100 years later, 150 years later, he's going to wipe them out. Babylonians and the Medes, God will judge them because they became proud. It's another message. But though God allowed them to chastise Israel, God will hold the Assyrians responsible for their pride because they said, look what a great thing we did. And they didn't realize that God had done it. That's getting deep. Then we see God's reversal. And we did the verse there. The Lord is not slack. He wants to see people saved. Jonah was vindictive. He wanted to see them punished. Again, God sees things differently. God would rather see them live for him in the world. Jonah still has some learning to do. That's going to be next week's sermon. A couple of things I want to explain here. Verse 10 says this. Let's read this verbatim because I think it, it can raise some questions. And it says, God saw their works that they um, turned from their evil way. And it says, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them. Two thoughts, or two, two things I want to explain here. The word repent traditionally means to turn away from. This isn't that word. This is where you go back to the original languages, folks. It's not a bad word. I'm not beating up the translation here. But we can pour too much into repent. Repent here, the word has the idea, the concept of having compassion on them. And God had compassion on them. And he really, he laid two, he, he, he gave them, he had them at a crossroads. You go side A, keep doing what you're doing, judgment is coming. Forty days, it's here. He says, but if you repent, then there's healing. So when it says God repented, God has never done any evil that you have to repent of. We think of repenting as when we do something wrong against God, we, we turn from it. And that's the right term. God exercised his compassion on these people because they, they repented. In fact, the word that's more usually applied to repent is, describes their things. It says because and they turned from their evil way. And the second word I just want to tap on here it says, God repented of the evil that he said. So can God do evil? This is one of those moral questions come down to the understanding of God. I think it's worth taking a minute here this morning. Can God do evil? And the answer is not in the way we think of it. God is, when you study God, this is with basic theology, um, God is impeccable. That is, he can't sin. He's incapable of sinning. So what does it mean here? God was going to do evil? What does the word evil mean? Well, I looked it up. And what he was going to do, he was going to judge them, but evil in the sense that he was going to, oh, where's my words? Pulled out of a dictionary here. He was going to bring calamity and distress on them is one of the definitions of evil. Yes, evil can mean sinning against God. That's not the word here. He's going to bring calamity and distress on them. They would have seen it. To them it was evil. Because they were going to be on the receiving end, being judged righteously. If God had done that, it would have been righteous. Because of what they had done. It would have been a righteous judgment. I think these things are worthy of explaining. Because you'll find this a couple of places in the Bible. And this is how we understand it. It's evil to the, the person that's going to be receiving. But it's evil in the sense of calamity, distress. is coming upon them. But it would have been righteous judgment. And maybe I'm going on too much there. But I think that's a, that's a worthy, worthy little explanation there. Okay, well, what a great chapter what to consider that God is the God of another chance. And maybe you're online today and this, oh, that re resonates to you. And maybe you sidelined yourselves. You need to come back to God. God's waiting. He is the God of the second chance. He's faithful to forgive us when we come to him. <clears throat> but we have a challenge, I think. And it's a reminder for people uh, to listen to God the first time. Oh, what if Jonah had just gone and done it? Who knows what would have happened? You know, there's consequences for our sin. You think about what were the consequences here? 
Jonah was in some displeasure for, or discomfort for a while. But the poor men that were, that were around him. By the way, sin doesn't always just affect us. It affects those around us. Those poor mariners that were unwilling to throw Jonah overboard threw their goods overboard, their livelihood. It cost them. Oh, be people that follow God the first time. We're warned in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. The Spirit leads us. It guides us. He directs us. Teach. Oh, follow Him. And watch God do wonderful things in our lives to mature us, bring fruit in our lives. And by the way, when you're following, make sure it's God and not yourself. There's a big difference. And that's a message maybe for another time. But Jonah, with God's simple message of repentance, will be eyewitness to the power of God and work a great revival in Nineveh. Oh, to be used for that. But I want to come back to just the one soul. Each soul is important. If you're here this morning or you're watching online and you've never turned to God, turned from your sins or placed your faith in Him, oh, why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? Eternity is a long time. And what an example here. God forgave this city full of wickedness. What an illustration. He forgave them. Why? Because they repented and they believed him. Don't put it off. And the Christians here, oh, are we following God with all of our heart, soul, and mind? Only you can answer that. I think in the West, our churches need revival. Revival starts with us when we turn back to God. Oh, we're a nation in need of revival. Oh, Jonah. Oh, we be the ones to end where I started. Will we be the ones in living Christ before a disbelieving world to offer that second chance, that third chance? And maybe there will be another Reverend Robert Morrison that will go out and rock the world for Christ, or even a Jonah. They will go and be obedient. Oh, that we would be that person. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for... Your Holy Spirit that guides us, oh, that we wouldn't quench it. I'm thankful that you are the God of second chances, but let us not be complacent in that. Help us to listen the first time. And Lord, I just keep coming back to this. It's on my heart. If there's someone that's been wounded, and someone that's sitting on the sidelines, perhaps watching online today, is maybe ashamed to come to church, oh, please come. There's forgiveness in God. He's got something for you. May not be the same thing, but oh, he's got something for you that we can do. Oh, you are the God of second chances. We praise you in that. Amen. Not men. Um, not good. Just about right. Well, this morning we're going to observe uh, Lord's Supper. And we'll be singing some verses here in a minute, but I just want to do an introduction here.